Good to see everyone. Those online, God bless you for joining us. And like the worship leader said, I want to repeat, Happy New Year. I think I'm going to keep saying Happy New Year until the end of this month. <laughs> so bear with me. Just in case some people are, don't come to church every Sunday. So some might not come until the end of the month. So I have to make sure I acknowledge them. So there's no offense. I say, I came to church. The pastor didn't even wish me Happy New Year. End of January. <laughs> Praise God. It's lovely to be in the house of the Lord, isn't it? God is amazing. I want to appreciate my daughter on the keyboards. CC. She has university exams. She's right in the middle of exams. And uh, she, we just can't give her, leave her alone. We've dragged her this morning. In fact, she came of her own anyway. Just appreciate you. God bless you, my daughter. Thank you. Thanks for supporting me. That song is uh, amazing. One of my brothers just reminded me about the background to that song, which we're going to take at the end of this. Yeah. But it was a song written by you know, somebody called Justin Dan Deventer. And uh, there was a lot of, you know, Justin, there's a lot of story behind that. And in his own words, he's just talking about how he came to write this song. He said, for some time I had struggled between developing my talents in the field of art and going into full-time evangelistic work. So there was that conflict. The Lord was calling him into evangelism, but he found that, no, he was really talented. He was, you know, sticking to that. But he said, at last, the pivotal hour of my life came and I surrendered all. A new day was ushered into my life from that moment. I became an evangelist and discovered down deep in my soul a talent hitherto unknown to me. God had hidden a song in my heart and touching a tender chord, he caused me to sing it. Praise God. So you can see how we've all been blessed ever since. And this song came from the moment he surrendered. I think it's just very good. Thanks, my brother, for encouraging me to look into that. I think it's fitting for us to look at that song and take it at the end of the service. Praise God. Anybody worshiping with us for the first time today? If it's your very first time, put up your hand. One, appreciate you. God bless you, sir. Let's, let's appreciate them. Anybody else? If it's your first time, let's say hello to them, anybody around them. God bless you. Yes, thanks for joining us. May God bless you. We really appreciate you making out the time. And I'm sure online there'll be people who also are joining us. We really appreciate you guys. Amen. It's the first Sunday of the year, 2024. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> Man, we become very comfortable. Ah, this is 2024. Man, many long to see this day, but didn't make it. But we are here because of the grace of the Lord. We have to appreciate every day and every moment. Amen. This year, 2024, is going to be a great year for us. Every year has always been great, but the Lord, Lord does greater things, isn't it? This morning, I want to speak on a word, and the title I've chosen is Be Fruitful. And that, for me, is the word I believe the Lord has given us as a church for this year. It's a year of fruitfulness. So I want you to key into that. This is a year of fruitfulness the Lord has given us. And the command is to be fruitful. Because it's a word I believe the Lord has given us, I'm going to try and spend some time to just lay the foundation as I believe the Lord has laid on my heart concerning what it means to be fruitful. Amen? Quite often we, we use words, you know, in uh, everyday context, which is fine. But I always kind of feel that as a church... When the Lord brings a word, it's important for us to try and, um, you know, seek his face as to what exactly he's trying to tell us. 
in the season that we find ourselves in. Be fruitful. Oftentimes when you think about what does it mean to be fruitful? I'm sure a lot of us, we kind of think, oh yeah, but that's simple. I mean, be fruitful just means be fruitful. You know, be productive. So the dictionary definition would be like producing much fruit. If it's in the case of like a plant or being fertile. But it's also say producing good or helpful results. And it says being productive. That's being fruitful. That's very good. Absolutely clear. But I want to look at it as I believe the Lord has wants us to see it. And we look at the being fruitful from biblical context to see what God is telling us as a church in this season. The first time the word fruits is used in the Bible is in Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. And I just thought it would be helpful to look at that. An interesting thing about the way the Lord does this thing, when the Lord introduces, I believe, a word in the scriptures, God takes time to explain to us what it's involved. And always remember that the way the scripture is written, which is why we need to always remember that the stories in the Bible are real stories, but they are also allegories. And you always have to be able to, when the Lord gives us the opportunity and opens up the scriptures to us, we begin to see the spirit behind the everyday and the natural, you know, story that we read. I'm going to just track back to the foundation by starting from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. Reading King James, New King James Version. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and every, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Praise God. So where would we derive our text, our team from that text, be fruitful and multiply, it says. So here we see the Lord talk about man. The Bible says God made man in his own image, created him in his own likeness, and then God said, Bless them and said, be fruitful and multiply. We now come to Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. Then God said, 11 and 12, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb, the feet that yields seed, and the fruits tree that yields fruits according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Amen? So we see the word fruit used there, even though in Genesis uh, so we then saw in Genesis 1.26 when the Lord now applied it to man. But it was first, fruit was first introduced there. And then if we look at that scripture, we can see the attributes of a fruit from that scripture. The first thing we see, the Bible says, you know, that it, the fruit comes from a tree generally. Yep, true. I mean, there are a few fruits that, you know, don't really grow on trees, but, you know, Lacking the, because you know they lack seed and all that, but generally the, the fruits come from a tree. So the Bible said, "The fruit tree that yields fruits according to its kind." 
So do we all agree on that? Yep. Then the other thing that we see is that the tree must yield fruit after its kind, the Bible says. Meaning that the fruit must be worthy of the tree. The fruit must be worthy of the tree. If the fruit is really from the tree, the fruit must have the attributes of the tree inside it. Is that true? That's what after its kind means, yeah? So that's the second thing. The tree must yield fruit after its kind, meaning that the fruit must be worthy of the tree. Literally, it should taste and look like the tree. Yeah? Which is why our Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew 7, 16 and 18, he said, you will know them by their fruits. He said, do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. So he says, you will know them by their fruit. Is that okay? So when you get the fruit, even without seeing the tree, you should be able to identify a tree basically from its fruit. So basically, there has to be something in this tree, in this fruit, that tells you, that connects it back to a tree. So if I come in and I hold a fruit and there are so many trees, I must look, there's something I must find in this fruit that will tell me which tree it belongs to. Does that make sense? Or where it came from? And the Bible tells us what that is. So the, so the fruit must be yield after its kind. And the third attribute we see there is that the fruit must have the seed of the tree in it. Very important. Do we all see that? It says, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind whose seed is in itself. So the seed of the tree must be in the fruit for that fruit to be an original and authentic fruit from that tree. So the evidence that this fruit is from the tree is a seed of the tree in it. Does that make sense? So very important. Remember, we have been fruitful this year. We need to understand what exactly it means to be fruitful. So we've seen the third attribute there. And the fourth attribute is that the seed must be according to its kind. It must be in the image of the original source. So if we open the fruit and we find the seed, if we do the DNA or whatever we check on that tree, the, the seed must match the image must match the tree. Is that correct? So that's exactly what the Bible says, that everything that God created is designed to bring forth fruit, to reproduce after its kind. Does that make sense? That means whatever fruit you bring forth, whatever fruit they bring must represent the source from which they came. Everything that God created. We saw that with the fishes and all that. He said, let the fish bring forth according to their, their kind, the birds, the animals, and also with man. Does that make sense? So man must bring forth fruit after its kind. So at the primary level, you see it as reproduction. Oh, yeah, your, the father, that's your son. Then the seed in that child must match the seed in the father. Now we can do things like DNA, scientific level, but in the scriptures, it goes beyond that. Does that make sense? But we're not allowed to do DNA anyhow because it can reveal things that are not meant to be revealed. (laughs) (laughs) So we walk by faith. (laughs) Say, this is your father. Oh, thank God, that's my father. (laughs) But if we were to open the fruits... And look at the seed inside that fruit. It must confirm the source. Does that make sense? So we looked at those attributes of a fruit. So you can see that a fruit is not just 
for God. Bible explains it in detail, what you need to look at. So the, 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 so the seed is key because the seed is the evidence of life in the fruit. So if the fruit has no seed in it, then it has no life. Does that make sense? It doesn't. If it's a seed-bearing fruit and it doesn't have seed in it, it has no life. So be careful about all these seedless things that we're eating now. Go back and check. Genesis 1 tells you what God gave you. I've given to man every seed-bearing fruit that has its seed in it for food, not seedless. I'll rest my case on that. <laughs> so the evidence, if this, if this fruit cannot sustain seed, it means it cannot sustain life. So if you're eating things that cannot sustain life, ask yourself, what are you putting into your body? The creator told you how it works. The evidence of life in this fruit is that it can sustain seed. If seed cannot grow in it, what has happened? So the seed is the evidence of life in the fruit. A fruit that lacks seed lacks life and is unable to replicate itself. True? It's true. So when you're doing all this, your gra- whatever, your mono, whatever they call it, you know, just remember, the key is, is there seed in this fruit? If the seed is there, it must be able to replicate the tree. The source. It doesn't matter you take that seed to China, you plant it, what's going to come out must be that tree that you left in Africa. Does that make sense? Amen. So when the Bible talks about trees, who are the trees? When the Bible talks about trees, the tree refers to you and I. We are the human beings. A lot of the time when the Bible uses the word trees for us, do you agree? Oh, well, yes, you are the tree. The Bible tells us in Psalm 1, blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly and all that. Say no. But he, though, seated not in the counsel of... And he tells you at the end of the day, but whose roots, you know, it shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. And the Bible tells us in Genesis, again, I don't want to go into detail, because that's not my subject for today, but I'm tempted to just raise it to and maybe you know, stare us. That the Lord God created first cause to come out of the ground all kinds of plants and trees, you know, in the garden. True? So all sorts of trees came. Trees that were good for food and all kinds of that. And I said, but, but, the tree of life was also in the garden. As well as the tree of good and evil. Very often, I think we assume that the tree of life also came out of the ground. Go back and read it. It was an also. So it's a different, it's a shift from the context of conversation. To tell you that the tree of life was there, but it didn't come out of the ground. So it's not a regular tree that grew out. And also, as well as the tree of good and evil. And we know that the tree of life is our Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't come out of the ground, but he was in the garden, as well as the tree of good and evil. So you can begin to understand when you're talking about what did we eat there, it's ideology rather than fruits. But in any case, let's come back to this. (laughs) So we are trees. The Bible is clear about that. So many scriptures reference tree. Now when we go to John chapter 15, in verse 1, we can just read that. Just to, I can see some faces. I say, Abba, what are you saying? I don't want to cause confusion. First Sunday in January. John chapter 15, I am the true vine. What is a, true, what is a vine? It can be a plant. It can be a tree. Some of them can grow enough. The Bible takes it as, you know, a tree. You know, I'm the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Praise. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, 
Neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered, and they gather and throw them into the fire and they are burned. Praise God. So Jesus is describing himself there as a tree, more like. And we are the branches. So when the Bible makes reference to trees, it's entities. It's not just the, you know, the trees as you understand them. In this case, the Bible is telling us about, you know, the, the source and the, and, the, and the tree. So the fruit tree, so the fruit is key. It must reflect the source. Every fruit that the tree brings forth must reflect the identity of the tree. And the identity of the tree must reflect its own original source because God created everything in on the earth to bring forth from us from ori original. Does that make sense? So if you and I are trees and we're bringing forth fruits, the fruits, the seed in the fruits must reflect us as a tree. We as a tree, if somebody was to sound us out and all, we must reflect our source, where we came from. And where do we come from? God. He made man in his image, in the likeness of God. So if we are bringing forth, we must bring forth as our kind. So every seed that is in every fruit we bring forth must reflect God. Because that is the origin of this tree. Am I making sense? So when we say be fruitful, and we are meant to bring forth fruit, we're trying to understand what is the acceptable type of fruits that we're meant to bring forth. Good? Every fruit we bring forth must have the identity of God in it. The seed must be the seed of God. Are we settled that? Praise God. So I've succeeded in that. My wife always prays for me when I'm trying to open a new tub. It's like, oh, let them understand God. <laughs> but we need to know these things. It is given to us to know. Praise God. Okay. So, fruitful work. So, when we now come to being fruitful, fruitful work is work that has the life of God inside it. Does that make sense? When Jesus said, be fruitful, when the Lord said, be fruitful, that means bring forth fruit. Now, a fruitful, the tree that is fruitful, for it to be fruitful, it must have the capacity to replicate itself. That's fruitfulness. Okay? So we are the branches. Remember, the vine does not bring forth any fruit. It's the branches that bring forth the fruit. The vine can grow thick and big. The trunk of it produces all the resources. But the seed, the fruit has to come from the branches. So Jesus is telling us, you are the ones that will bear the fruit, not me. But I'm going to give you all the resources. You need to be connected with me as the vine. If you're disconnected with me, you cannot bear fruit that represents me. They might graft you onto another plant and you can bring forth, but not the fruit you're bringing cannot reflect me because you're disconnected from me. Does that make sense, guys? So the Bible, Lord said, be fruitful. So we are meant to be fruitful. That means the fruit of anything we do, the works, when it is tested, it must reflect God. True? It must reflect, the seed of it must reflect God. So fruitful work is work that has the life of God in it. Because the seed is the life of the plant. The life of the tree is in the seed. Which is why it's important that the fruit has the seed. If the fruit does not have the seed, it has no capacity to 
replicate that tree. So that means the tree can be extinct in no time. So we, as the fruit bearers of Jesus, we need to look what kind of quality of fruit are we bringing. If we're bringing fruit that does not have the seed in it, that does not have the life of Jesus in it, in no time Jesus will be extinct, as it were, in quote. So it's important that we, the fruit we're bringing forth has the seed which reflects the source of the tree. And each, everything must bring forth according, after his kind. Of all the creatures of God, man is the only one that has both heaven and earth in himself. So we and the animals were created from the earth, from the dust of the earth. True? We're exactly the same. But the difference between man and the animals is that man has the earth and also has heaven. Because the spirit of God was put into him. So he has the earth molded from the dust of the earth. Then the breath of life which came from heaven is in him. So man carries both heaven and earth in him. Which is why he is designed to know the mind of God. He's designed as God. And everything that he brings forth must reflect God. That is his source. He's not the earth. The animals can rest on this side. But man's fruit must have the seed of life in it. Does that, does that make sense? Praise God. So I'm, I'm moving on. So for man's work to be considered fruitful by God, it must be brought forth after its kind. In the, you know, in the image of the original. It has to have the image of God. So fruitful work must be in accordance to the will and purpose and the plan of God, which the seed must reflect. True? So everything, the works we do here, we're bringing forth, Bible sees it as us bringing forth fruit. Jesus commanded us to go and bring forth fruit. So we are the tree, the fruit has to come from us, but the quality of the fruit matters. The quality of the fruit must reflect God. The life of God must be in it. So how can we be fruitful? What is it that makes us? Now we know we have to be fruitful in the sense that we need to bring forth the fruit that has the life of God in it. How does that come about? How? How does that come about? Fruitfulness is not the result of work in the sense that we understand it. Because the dictionary definition of fruitfulness, being productive by the world standard, is that you work hard, you make money, you buy things, you're very productive, your hours are used properly, you know, you're successful. That's, that's the dictionary definition. And that's also the world's definition of good, success, of success, considered good. So you're productive and all that. But that's not the way the Bible tells us. Because the Bible is telling us that every work that we do, every good thing that we bring forth, it doesn't matter how much the world celebrates it. It's like, wow, this guy is a professor three times over. He's man, he's rich, he's God, must be blessing him. There's no doubt that we all have access to the providential gift of God. You don't need to believe in him. You don't even need to acknowledge him. It's a providential gift. Anybody can, it doesn't mean. So it doesn't, the fact that you're richer than somebody doesn't mean that God is blessing you more than that person. The evidence of God's blessing on his creature, on a man, is the fruits that that person brings forth. Because where God's blessing is, the result is fruitfulness. True? Where God's blessing is, there must be fruitfulness. But it's not in terms of material prosperity. It's in terms of the quality of the fruit. Which is why Jesus told us in that Matthew. He said a good tree cannot bring back, cannot bring forth bad fruit. 
and a battery can never bring forth because it means that the DNA, the origin of it, a good tree in that regard is a tree that is connected to the original tree in the garden. Remember our source, the source of this tree is the tree of life. So you and I are, the, are trees, but our, we're, de, we're derived from the tree of life. So if we're a good tree, we must be able to have the DNA of the tree of life in us. So it is impossible for us to produce anything other than that if we're truly connected to the vine, which is why I said it's impossible. You can't be connected to the vine and bring forth anything other than the fruits of the vine. True? So fruitfulness is not according to hard work, according to the man, man's system. No, you don't work to be fruitful in God's plan. Fruitfulness is the effect or the result of God's blessing, which is the God commanding his Zoe life into any situation. The Bible tells us in Psalm 133 that where brethren dwell together, that's where the Lord commands his blessing. So when God commands his blessing, there has to be fruitfulness. Because the command, God's blessing, blessing is spiritual. Only God can bless. We bless as men, but that blessing is subject to God's approval. Does that make sense? Which is why I remember the case of Balaam. You know, they had a reputation. He said, whoever you bless is blessed. Whoever you curse is cursed. And he came to the children of Israel. And then Balak said, curse him. He said, I cannot bless or curse. I cannot curse the man that God has blessed. <laughs> but he had a reputation that anybody he blessed was blessed. Anybody he cursed was cursed. But when he came to the children of Israel, <laughs> no way. He said, I can't. Because he realized that all that blessing that people were celebrating him for was approved by God. But this one is not approved. So it's a meaningless blessing. So people can bless you if God doesn't approve of it. It's just mouth. They're just mouthing. Somebody can be angry with you. Who oh, have blessed you? I bless you. What kind of blessing is that? <laughs> but the blessing that is the real blessing, your psalm say, it make it rich and it has no sorrow. And this is the kind of blessing that Jacob desired. He knew what he was. Only one. Remember, Esau said, ah, ah, Father, don't you have any more blessing? There was only one. Because the Father could have blessed him anyhow. But if he was left to the Father. But no. He needed to be approved by God. Aaron, the Lord raised him as a priest. He said, I put in him that he will proclaim my blessing over the children of Israel. So Aaron had that. Anybody else could proclaim it was just lip service. But where God's blessing is, there must be fruitfulness. True? Psalm 28, verse 1 and 4. Blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Say, so blessed is the man that fears the Lord. So how do we get fruitfulness? It's through blessing. How does the blessing come? One attribute is the fear of the Lord. And when you come to Deuteronomy chapter 28, they call it the blessings of obedience. Obedience is key for us to be able to access the blessing. But when the blessing comes, there is no Jupiter, I must use that word, slang, that can stop you, the work of God. It doesn't matter the native doctor or the magician, you're just wasting your time. That's why Balaam, as powerful as he was, couldn't do anything. The Lord's blessing had, God said, I have blessed. You cannot curse. That is what the Bible calls curseless curse that cannot stand. Psalm 28, blessed is everyone who fears the Lord. Can you imagine? Automatic blessing. If you have the fear of God, blessed. Who walks in his ways? And verse 3 says, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. What does that mean? Your wife shall be like a fruitful vine. Somebody say, yes, your wife will have children and all. That's not what God is talking about there. Go back to the meaning of fruitfulness now that you know what fruitfulness is. Your wife shall be a fruitful vine, not just a woman that gives birth to children. 
It's a woman that brings forth the fruits that has the seeds of God in it. Does that make sense? Are you guys with me? Or is it just me exciting myself? <laughs> your wife, I want us to understand meaning in scripture. It changes your identity when you know. This is not so. That's why sometimes we pray, we, we claim scripture, and nothing happens. Because we don't understand. Your wife, the man, God has blessed this man. As a result, your wife shall be a fruitful vine. That means she will not bring forth for trouble. She can never bring forth for trouble. She will bring forth the fruit that has the seed of God in it. Does that make sense? Okay, let's prove that. Genesis chapter 17. Remember the story of Sarah and Abraham and Sarah? She was barren. No? The woman had been so barren that, in fact, barrenness itself was... Uh, you just difficult. You couldn't describe Sarah without. You can't talk about barrenness without talking about Sarah. True. It's almost equivalent to Sarah. Every time you talk about barrenness, you remember Sarah. So she was. She had. Bible said she had passed. She had. She had forgotten what it was like to be a woman. Let's put it that way. All the thing that makes you a woman was gone. The breast was like a man's breast. She, the, there's not even her voice. I'm sure was like Abraham's voice. Because all the estrogen that will make your voice soft, they will have gone. The woman was gone. The Bible says she was as good as dead. True? And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 17, verse 16, God speaking, and I will bless her. Remember, what comes with blessing? Fruitfulness. God said, I will bless her. And then give her a son also. Yea, I will bless her. And she shall be a mother of nations, multiplications. So this woman was dead. When, when the blessing of the Lord came, fruitfulness must result. She became that Proverbs 28 woman. Fruitful. The wife of the blessed Abraham was fruitful in his house. And she brought forth the fruit that had the seed of God in it. Remember, that was the promise of God to Abraham. That the seed, he said, in, your, in, in Isaac shall your seed be reckoned. So the woman brought forth, not just the son, brought forth fruit that had the seed of God inside it. Which is why the Bible tells me and you that if we be of Christ, we are of Abraham's seed. So that same seed, the lineage, is what we're all enjoying today. But this woman was a fruitful vine because the husband was blessed by the Lord. True? So death went out the window. Where God's blessing comes, it is God's life introduced into the situation. It doesn't matter how dead the situation is. If the blessing of the Lord enters into it, it must change. It must be fruitful. This year, the Lord is telling us, be fruitful. He said, it's, it's, God has proclaimed fruitfulness on us. But we need to understand what it takes to access that. We've talked about fear of the Lord, talked about obedience. Over the months, we can look at a few other things. But you can see how, what happens, true? We we'll come to Genesis 26. Remember the story of Isaac? Bible talks about farming in the land, in the Gera. There was so much farming, the, 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 the earth was like rock. Nobody would put any seed in the ground because it wasn't going to germinate in Gera. Even the king of Gera, there was no water. People would dig wells, there was no water coming out of it. And Isaac was going to go down to Egypt. Because Egypt was prosperous, just like people running to America. And, all that thing. and by, but. America, of course, with all his uh, sin and all that. Egypt was exactly. So Isaac was going to go into Egypt. And the Lord said, don't go to Egypt. Stay in this land. And I will bless you. You see that? Isaac was like, man, there's nothing here. God said, stay. It does not matter where you are. It does not matter how bad the environment is. It does not matter how bad the economy is. It does not matter what is happening today. 
What you need is the blessing of the Lord. Does that make sense? The Lord says, stay in this land. He said, but Lord, man, there's nothing happening here. Everything is dead in this land. The Lord said, stay in this land. And what? I will bless you. And the Bible tells all the story. Then Isaac sowed in that land, the land that was rock solid. And he reaped in the same year a hundredfold. Why? Because the Lord blessed him. You see what I'm saying? When God's blessing comes, the result is fruitfulness. It's impossible for there not to be fruitfulness when God's blessing comes, except by ourselves. If we ourselves stop the flow of the blessing by disobedience, by lack of fear of God, by living in sin and doing our own thing. Does that make sense? Are you with me? I haven't lost too many people. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) You know? And the Lord Jesus said, I'm divine. And you are the branches. He said, beside me, you can do nothing. This is Jesus. But it's like, you know, somebody can say, oh. Is Jesus saying that you can only be productive and produce good and helpful results if your work is done as initiated by him? The answer is yes, sir. That's what he's saying. He said, but what about all these people that are out there that are rich and all that? Jesus said, those are called dead works. Why? Because the fruit that is brought forth does not have the seed of God in it. So those works are called dead works. Because they cannot reproduce life. Does that make sense? So you, Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. It doesn't matter how successful you think you are. If I am not in you and you are in me, your success is zero. It doesn't count. You can be the richest man on earth. People might say, wow, God really loves this man. Look at all the money he has given him. Jesus said, it counts for nothing. Because that fruit does not have the life of God in it. Remember the story of the rich young man? Came to Jesus. He said, good master, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? Jesus said, why call me good? No one is good except God. Listen to that. Wow. Because somebody can say, well, I do all these good works, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I give money to charity. I'm very, he's a very, he's a philanthropist. Well, he doesn't believe in God. He has no time for Jesus. And everyone's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. God, surely the man is doing some good works. Jesus is saying those things, good, those works that man call good, they are not God's own definition of good. Which is why this rich young man called Jesus good master. Jesus said, don't call me good. I, nobody is good in this flesh. Only God is good. So God can never accept what you do by your own qualification of good. Outside of him. You might say, but it's obvious, however. People are suffering in Iran. I want to move money there. There's Kuwait. Let's put money into Kuwait. Let's support them. This man is sending shiploads of food and everything, but he doesn't have time for Jesus. Sorry, the Bible says dead works. Those are fruits he's bringing forth, but they do not have the DNA of God in them. That fruit doesn't have life. Does that make sense? Why is this? Why is that? Why is it that something that the word says good is not acceptable as God to good as good? The good young man, the young man said, "Good." He said, "God, I've done all this. I'm good. I'm good." Jesus said, "Man, there's nobody that is good. Can you imagine that? Why is that? Go back to Eden. Go back to Eden. Look at those two trees." The tree of life was there. There's a tree of good and evil. It's true. What, was it? what, was, what did the enemy tell man? He said you will eat of the tree of good and evil. And then you will be like God, isn't it? And the Bible said that when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, isn't it? Good. And it was pleasant. So the problem was that the enemy, devil created an alternative reality in Eden. He moved man from the reality and created an alternative reality. 
such that he's telling him that you can decide what good is. But God says never. So man can never determine what good represents in God's book. It does not matter what that, you can be feeding all the orphans in England. You don't believe in Jesus, you don't care about God, it is dead works. I am telling you what the scripture says. You might say that doesn't make sense. True. The things of God do not make sense. Which is why it's a paradox most times in scripture. And a paradox is something that is unreasonable. That means you cannot reason it. Because your intellect, your human intellect cannot understand it. So it has to be unreasonable if it's the things of God. Which is why he said a man cannot seek, find God by his own wisdom. It's got to be by faith. And faith is the revelation of God unto man by the Spirit of God. And when, you, when he reveals to you, you will know it. He said you, when you hear the truth, you will know it. Your being will connect with it. You will have peace. You don't need anybody to qualify the truth for you. Does that make sense? So, so let's be clear. Because sometimes we get confused. You say, well, you can't tell me that this man is so good, so humble, but he doesn't have love Jesus, though that means he's not good. He's not accepted in the beloved. He is not accepted in the beloved. As to what God will do with him, that's up to God. But as far as the scriptures are concerned, he is not in the vine. And Jesus said, without me, outside of me, you are nothing. Does that make sense? So for us to be fruitful, we must remain in the vine. Because the fruit we bring forth must always have the seed of the vine in it. And it has the capability of replicating itself. True? So goodness does not count because that was the sin of man in Eden. The devil arrogated goodness to himself. That's why the Bible called it the tree of good and evil. He said, I will ascend unto the north, you know, I'm sitting with the congregation of the earth, and I'll be like the, the most high. So he considered himself good. That's why he was called the tree of good and evil. He believed he was good. So his goodness ended with him. But man decided to eat of him. So man, till today, tries to use good to determine what is acceptable to God. Even in the church, sadly. We make our plans most times by what looks good. But that is not what God says we should do. No, 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 no. We plan our programs, we plan things based on what seems good to us. Oh, it would be good for the, for the children to go to, you know, so that's not how it works. It is not a good plan that we want. It's a God plan. Does that make sense? It's a God plan. So am I saying that we should not plan far from it? We are meant to plan. But the scriptures tell us how to do it. Amen? The problem with us most times is that the nature of man is that man cannot contain not knowing. We have to know. So that's why we have to have plans a lot of the time. But it's okay to plan. God doesn't plan. But we need to plan in the right way. You know? Man cannot bear not knowing. When we don't know, it makes us anxious. So we tend to then put plans in place. The danger with that is that very soon the church becomes a religious organization. Which is, and God said in Malachi, I hate religion. Because religion becomes a dogma. It becomes a set of rules. It's like this is how we must do it. This is what we have planned. We can't shift from it. That is not how we are meant to operate God's business. Does that make sense? We cannot. The danger with that, it becomes a religion. Oh, we have three songs and then we go into the world and we're, no. That's not the way. We must always seek what the Lord is wanting us to know. So the Bible wants us to plan. Jeremiah 10, 23, however, tells us, Oh, Lord, I know the way of a man is not in himself. It is not in a man who walks to direct his own steps. Look at that. Can you imagine? I don't have that up. Yeah. But Jeremiah 10, 23, he says, It is not in a man who walks to direct his own steps. 
So imagine how you and I are thinking that we can plan our lives and all that. Scripture is saying it's not in us, outside of God. Do we agree? But we are told how we should do things. Proverbs 6, 1, 16, 1, we can make our own plans, the Bible says, but the Lord gives the right answer. So it's important to make your plans. It's important, but the plan has to be in accordance with the guidance and the leading of the Spirit of God. Even when you make it and you lay it down, keep it there. Give time for the Lord to give you the answer as to whether this is the way to go. Proverbs 16, 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Does that make sense? So as we enter this new year, and we all have our dreams, God gives, gives us dreams. It's okay to dream. We have our plans, we have our desires. We need to think, how do we actualize them? How do we go about it? Well, as you know, you have a plan for the whole year, you have a personal plan and all that, which is all good. But the Bible tells us that those are in man's hearts, but the Lord needs to establish those steps. So it's important for us to understand that it's not about a good plan, it is a God plan that we want. Amen? In Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, Verse 1 says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see how it works? The first thing to do is to put down this body and lay it on the altar of sacrifice. In the body contains your intellect, your human knowledge and intellect, your own goodness. Bible said, carry your body and lay it on the altar of sacrifice. And Put a fire under it and let this fire consume the sacrifice. So the, the body and our own intellect and our own wisdom and our own you know, sense of who we are has to go out the window first. It then comes to verse 2. Because say if you don't do that, that means we're conforming to the ways of the world. Because the world are the ones that believe in them. Say, oh, I don't need anybody. I can, I can run my own life. I know where I'm going. This is my plan. This is okay. You can do that. But you're conforming, conforming to the world. But it says if you don't do that, if you can put your body under, lay it as a sacrifice on the altar, then it says in verse 2, then, only then will you be able to test and approve and understand what, the, what is the good, pleasing, and acceptable will of God for you as you journey on into this year? Does that make sense? So it's very important for us. Waiting is difficult for us as human beings. Let's be mindful of that. But God wants us to wait on him. It's important that we wait. We don't like it. So we, sometimes the danger is which we need to be careful about in our personal lives, and also even in church life. Let's not structure God out of church. We might want to put down every single thing tightly. And then when somebody changes one program, it's like, oh. You can have a tantrum, you have a meltdown. Or say, but I've been working on this for the past three months. But yeah, Jesus said, forget it. But you, you won't forget it. It becomes offense, isn't it? You say, but now I can't. I've been working on it. I said, but Jesus said, forget it. He said, how can Jesus say, forget it when I've been working on it for three months? This is the danger, the offside of over planning and being rigid. Let's allow interruptions from the Spirit of God. Bible said you do not own yourself. He said you are bought at a price. But that's, you need to understand that. 
It's not about you and I. If you're really a believer and you believe in Jesus, you do not own yourself. Jesus has paid a price for you already. So he has the authority and the right to change whatever he wants in your life at any point in time. Well, how many of us accept that? No. So we end up coming to church and we are running on our own agenda. Remember the problem with Cain and Abel? What was the problem? Cain was a worshiper of God, you know. Do you know? Oh, only a few people. Everyone was like, oh. Listen, go and look at your scriptures. There were two, Cain and Abel represented two churches. They were both worshippers of God. They both built altars to God. They both brought sacrifice to God. And God communed with them. In fact, God had more conversation with Cain than Abel. Go and look at the scripture. <laughs> so these guys were churchgoers. But the difference was that Cain was going to church on his own terms. Abel went on God's terms. But Cain knew what the right thing was. Because the Bible told him, say, why are you off offended? If you do the right thing, will you not be accepted? If God said, if you do the right thing, God knows that Cain knew what the right thing was. But he didn't want to do it. God said, but you know the right thing. If you do it, you'll be accepted. So it's about us accepting who the Lord and Master is. So many of us are in Christendom. We've been coming to church for a year, but we're still living like Cain lived. Your personal life, our morality doesn't conform with the word of God. The Bible said, don't live in sin. Sex outside of marriage not accepted. We say, well, that doesn't, doesn't matter. That's old-fashioned. I love Jesus. I'm going to go to church anyway. But I'm going to live with my partner. And so many other things. There's no need. It's, that is Cain's problem. Cain loved God. But he could not submit his body, his own desire and his own intellect to the will of God. Many of us still live that way. Let the word of God speak to us today. There's no condemnation, but there should be wisdom. If we truly believe and we serve God, we must lay our body, our flesh, our own ideas on that altar of sacrifice, according to Romans chapter 12. And then we can then begin to have an understanding of what the true will of God is. We can't dip in and out of church. We do it in our own way. We live a life totally contrary to what the scriptures tell us outside of church. And we come in on a Sunday and we go out and there's no conviction. And when somebody speaks about it, we actually take offense. What right does he have to be talking into my what's his business? They asked him to come and preach. He's telling me about how I live my life. <laughs> I'm sure that sounds familiar. But see, Bible says in Psalm 27, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Why would the scripture tell you to be strong and be and be courageous to wait for the Lord. Because it takes strength and courage to wait. And to do things God's way rather than man's way. Because the fear of man is always around us. And it's a snare. People might think, oh, this is where we should go. Oh, why, is, why are you not doing this? What? You know? But for you to stand on the word of God, it takes courage. Remember the story of, of David and the, the Ziklag matter? Bible said he came to Ziklag. All the wives have been carried away and the children by marauders. He had these 600 mighty warriors who were fearless men but godless. These men will cut off your head in two seconds. And they came, with, they have gone for, to, to raid somewhere. And he came back and their wife and children are gone. And they were like, come on, let's pursue. David said, no, wait on the Lord. He's like, what? What are you talking about? And the guys were raging. And the Bible said they had decided to stone him to death. But David did not flinch. The Bible said David delighted himself in the Lord. He said he waited on the Lord. He kept asking, Lord, should I pursue? Will I overtake? Will I recover all?
Can that be your question this year, 2024? Lord, should I pursue this direction of thought, this direction of business? Lord, should I pursue? Will I overtake? Will I recover all? He waited on the Lord. This is why the psalmist said, wait for the Lord. Number one, be strong and take heart. And then he goes on and repeats this and wait for the Lord. Twice in that verse. Because he knows how difficult it is for man to wait on God. The fallen nature of man does not like to wait on God. Everything looks obvious. Why do I have to pray about it? This is common sense. All this praying about everything. Every time I want to pray about everything. We can't run God's business like that. We must seek his face. Praise God. He says, without me, you can do nothing. It does not matter what you achieve. In Acts 13, 2 to, 2 to 3, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Listen to that conversation. While they were worshiping the Lord, praying and fasting, what, what happened? The Holy Spirit, God himself, said, set apart these two guys for what? For the work which I have called them to do. So the key for us is to do the work that God has appointed for us. Not work that looks good. Not things that look nice. Not because another church has done it. We want to know the work that God has appointed for us. As individuals and as a church. And the place of knowing that is in the place of seeking the Lord's face. The prayer and fasting, the Lord gave his command. That's why as a church, we have decided that we will start this year with prayer and fasting. So 22nd of January, the leaders will start for the first week, and then the rest of the church will join on the 29th. We'll run for two weeks to the 11th of February. Remember, there's no compulsion. Nobody is compelled. Do as the Spirit leads you. Amen? But we do believe that it's in the interest of the whole body that we wait and seek God's face. Amen? Last night, we had the leaders meet, meeting and envisioning night, and we looked at the different, what we believe the Lord is laying on our hearts as a vision for the church this year. And I believe that all the department heads are going to take that and are going to look into it, and they're going to try, and as they look at their own, the vision for their own department, which must stem out of the primary vision for the church, I believe the Lord will grant wisdom for each department head to know what God really wants them to do and how he wants them to run the program for their own department in accordance with what God has shown us as his will for us. But the word he has given us, which I believe if we can key into, is that this is a year of fruitfulness. Amen? He said we must be fruitful this year. And we know that the key way to get fruitful is not by laboring. It's not by us cracking our head as to, oh, we have to multiply all the people, you know, fill the church. No. Jesus said, I will build my church. No human being builds God's church. He builds his own church. We, don't, we shouldn't lose sleep over this church. I don't, once, I, once my head is on the pillow, I'm gone. I'm telling you, people always feel sorry for me. How about this your committee? I say, I'm not, I'm not sorry for myself. There's grace. My wife will tell you, we're both of us, once, in fact, she's faster than me. <laughs> I will talk to my wife and say, oh, she's gone. It doesn't matter how, serious, because it's not our job. We are workers. There is the owner of the business. And our job is to seek his face, to know which way he wants us to go. Let's not quarrel over the God's work. Let's not get offended. Let's not stress over it. Let's enjoy his presence this year. And allow the Spirit of God to lead us. Amen? Is that good? Yes. Let's rise up. Let's rise up. Let's rise up. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's speak to Jesus. Let's exalt him.
Let's determine to surrender all. Let's determine to surrender all this year. And truly surrender all, not just by words, but by our deeds, by our actions, in our thoughts, and everything that we do. Let's surrender all to Jesus this morning. I want you to ask for grace, for the Lord to enable you by his grace. Say, Lord, help me by your grace to truly surrender all to you. We heard the story of this guy that wrote this song. Said he was wrestling with the will of God for five years or more. But the day he made that decision, he said it was a new dawn for him. The light of God broke into his life. And on the back of that, he wrote this song, which has continued to bless humanity. If this was the only thing that God had in store for him, if this was the purpose that the Holy Spirit has set him apart for, if that is alone, it's enough. Because the hearts that have been touched, the souls that have been comforted by this song, at times of difficulty, you cannot put a value to it. So we want to, just like Saul and Barnabas, we want the Lord to lead us, Holy Spirit to set us apart as a church for the work that he has appointed unto us. Not for work that we think, not for the things we think in our own mind will be good to see, but only the will of God. So I want you to ask for yourself the same, that the Lord will reveal to you by his Holy Spirit what his will for you and the work that he has set aside for you in this year, 2024, the Lord show me the work that you have set aside for me. So we ask, oh Lord, by your grace, for the, for the grace to surrender all to you, Lord. This year, 2024, keep us from running on our own steam, in our own intellect. Let your Holy Spirit guide us. It is not in a man that works to determine his own steps. But you are the one that gives the answer to every plan that we have. Lord, help us. Keep us from error. Keep us from going down the wrong path. Let your peace be perpetually upon us in this year, 2024. Either in plenty or in little, let your name be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Amen.